five years in the classroom teaching photography, and um, one can go on. I one can you know pontificate. I don't want to. I don't want to go on too long here. So you're um, used to an hour and a half, not 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I you know I I'm sorry that I missed it, opening remarks, but I just want to thank S Steve for the concept of bringing photographers together, and it's been thrilling. I've been saying to John to see the diversity of the work here, that, and your, your, your personal vision uh, about the world you photograph is coming through so strongly in, in all the work. I mean, I'm very moved to be part of this. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm less inclined to talk about each of the photographs individually. It, it, it's a body of work, but I'd be more than happy to, if you had a question about how did a certain photograph come to be, I, I, I will answer that, but I wanted to tell you how did I come to do this project. Um, let, let's say I've, I've spent my entire life, my entire adult life, photographing. And may, maybe like many of you, I started photography as a teenager after joining the camera club at high school and having a camera put in my hand, and realizing that the camera was my way of saying something very specific about the world as opposed to writing. I, 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 I did not enjoy writing. I didn't feel confident in expressing myself <coughs> in words. But the camera pointing at me and I'll point it here and not here includes something to me was just so liberating. And I suppose being 16 years old and the mechanics of the camera, it was a Mamaya Twin Lens Reflex mm. and a, a Goss and Luna Pro light meter that was loaned out. Um, that, you know, I think men and boys are fascinated with the f-stops, the shutter speeds, the mechanics, and things. but um, I soon came to realize that, that the camera was this incredible tool that I could use to say something about the world, something very specific. So after high school, I, I, went, to, I went to a liberal arts college for a year. I wanted to study photography, and I went to um, Franklin Institute in Boston. They had a great photo program there. And after I graduated, uh, the University of New Hampshire in Durham, New Hampshire, was looking for a darkroom technician. They contacted the school. The school said, oh, uh, we, had, we just had a student graduated. We're going to recommend that you invite him for an interview. Um, I was interviewed along with a number of other candidates. I was only 20 years old. And I was hired, and I spent nine months in the darkroom working at the university. Then I was promoted to assistant photographer. And I also had a very strong interest in film at that time. And the director of the department um, was very interested in the idea that we would produce educational documentary films at the university. And I had made a film with a psychology professor that was very successful for what, for what its intent was. And the director said, well, you did a great job on that. And I'm going to find the money to buy the gear you need to shoot 16 millimeter movies. And so I made a film. The first real film I made was uh, the history of the textile mills in Manchester, New Hampshire, mm. uh, which was the largest producer of textiles mm. in the world. That film was the first film available on the history of New Hampshire, really, and it was used extensively. Um, that led to my making another seven or eight films about New Hampshire history and culture. One of those films was a film about the great German photographer, Lana Jacobi, portrait photographer, mm -hmm. who had moved from uh, Berlin. She was Jewish. She, had, she moved from Berlin in 1935. She knew that if she didn't move, um, she was going to lose her studio. She was, her, her great grandfather had bought photo gear from Louis Daguerre and started the, the, the portrait business. Anyway, Lada was uh, living in New Hampshire. She moved to New York in 35, and then she moved to New Hampshire in 1955. And uh, a photographer friend said, I know Lada. Uh, let me introduce you to her. Um, and uh, we hit it off. And uh, the university and myself proposed that we make a film about her life. I made a film. We became great friends. Lada, who's just this incredible portrait photographer, you know, she made an extended portrait of Albert Einstein, beautiful photographs of Robert Frost, the, the poet, uh, J.D. Salinger, the only real photographs of J.D. Salinger made by Lada Jacobi. She photographed Eleanor Roosevelt, 
um, Thomas Mann. It's a who's who of intellectuals and great people of the 20th century. Anyway, she uh, decided that she was going to um, donate her entire archive of negatives to the university if the university agreed that I would work with her to catalog the collection. So I, so here's Lauded's great mentor, portrait photographer, and I spent six years going through her work, studying her work, cataloging it. We took the negatives out of old glassy envelopes, made new proofs, put them in archival envelopes, created a computer catalog. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I have to list my heroes. Lauded Jacoby as this great portrait photographer, and her, you know, the thing, the guiding light, I think, for Lauded in terms of portrait work is, uh, she said, let the person rule the frame. Let the photograph be about the person in front of the camera. It, it, shouldn't, it, it shouldn't be about you. And we all know that there are great photographers who do portrait work, but sometimes those photographs are really more about the photographer than they are about the subject. I think of Richard Avedon, a confrontational photographer. I love his work, but it's really more about Avedon than it is about the subject. So, so Lada was just a great you know, let's say not a formal teacher, but looking at her work, listening to her philosophy, um, making it easy for people to sit in front of the camera. Um, she would move to make it easy. She, she wouldn't move the person. She, she, she'd move until she could get the com composition right. She's looking at the lighting. She had many years of experience working in the studio, but she also shot more candid portraiture by the other way. Um, historical figures that are very meaningful to me. Alfred Stieglitz and the extended portrait of Georgia O'Keeffe, if you're not familiar with it. To see that body of work of uh, Georgia from a young woman starting out as, as a painter through her uh, middle age years, uh, just I'm in awe of that work. It informs my work. Uh, Paul Strand, some of Britt mentioned Paul Strand before. Oftentimes I think Paul Strand sitting on my shoulder saying, Gary, take this picture. I mean, I love Strand's directness in making photos, especially portraits. And I had the good fortune. I must have been just a year out of school. It must have been 71 or 72. There was a huge show in Boston at the, at the um, Museum of Fine Arts of Strand's work. I think there were 600 prints. And most of them were contact prints from 5 by 7 inch negatives. Um, and it was like you had died to had gone to heaven. It was a complete course in the beauty of a gelatin silver print. And I was emotionally exhausted after going through that show, but the strands just certainly what one of my years. And um, uh, the other, you know, the, the other person who doesn't really do, who never really did portraits much is um, Carlton Watkins. And Watkins, I'm just in awe of Watkins because uh, he he's really the American landscape photographer in the 19th century who invented what I'm going to say is the language of composition for landscape. Are you familiar, familiar with Watkins' work? Because, yeah. you know, if you're not, your homework tonight from a teacher is like, just Google Carlton Watkins' work because he, and he made 1,300 mammoth plate negatives, 18 by 22 inch. It was a tremendous show at the Metropolitan Museum of Art of his work and that, that was sort of a changing point turning point in my life just to see this dedication and the quality of the work that he did. And um, even though I'm not a landscape photographer, I have the greatest admiration for what, for what he accomplished. Um, so it's even who have I, who I, who I, who else have I, um, I, mean that, I think those are the major figures that, you know, um, I have some environmental portraits here and I think you always have to acknowledge Arnold Newman as, as a, as a as a kind of mentor there. So I spent nearly 30 years at the university as the university was overlapped by 30 years teaching at the New Hampshire Institute of Art where I was the chair of the photo department. And I, I retired a couple of years ago. And I was always drawn to do portrait work. I knew I learned early on that if you were going to be recognized for something, it's good to give people some kind of a handle. And I thought, um, the thing I feared the most when I started was of the interaction. And I thought, but if I did portrait work, I'll never run out of subjects. <laughs> so I resolved in the very late 70s that I was going to seriously 
photograph people, and I didn't have a studio, so there'll be environmental portraits, and I also just decided I would use a view camera because that slowed down the process. Now, I don't know, you know, some people are amazing, like uh, Joel, you know, you've, you've got Henry Cartier Bresson and all these things, wonderful things going on, and you, you get that incredible, candid moment. I, I'm not that fast sometimes. I have to slow things down. So the view camera, would, you know, the camera's on the tripod, and I, I can more easily control the subject, and um, I can more than to be like, I'm not so quick with a, with a smaller camera. Not that I don't, I don't use a smaller camera sometimes. Uh, so I, I, I worked on making portraits with a large format camera for uh, you know, several decades of doing environmental portraits, concentrating on artists and creative people, because I thought they were more open to my uh, approach to photography. And uh, some of my work was uh, collected in, in museums, the Courier Museum in, in Manchester, but uh, a range of my work, which obviously you know, it's very gratifying when, when, when an institution says we're going to preserve some of your work. And I, I, get, I, I came to a point where I thought, I love to do portraits, but as an artist, I need to take a big risk. I, I need to go someplace that's scary. And so I thought, if I'm going to stay with the portrait, why not, um, and having looked at Weston Stieglitz arranged work, why not explore a contemporary portrait of women, but as new portraits? And that, I really sort of formally decided to, on that in 2006. And I thought, I'm going to spend 10 years working on, on those phot uh, on photographs. Um, and I also knew that for some people, like if they see any photograph and the subject doesn't have clothing, some people are going to say that's pornography. It, it, it's not going to be acceptable to some people. And I, so I thought there's a risk there also. And there's a risk because I had never done any, I had never photographed um, uh, people in the nude. I'm sure I was more nervous than some of the subjects. Uh, but again, I, I did decide that I was going to use a large format camera to slow down the process. And you know, learning from WADA, uh, Jacoby, um, I need to pay 100% attention to the subject. And that means that I cannot be fussing with the camera too much, <laughs> the lighting too much. And you know, uh, these photographs are made in the studio. Um, and the rest are, are on location, but uh, you know if you're if you're fussing with the camera, oh, that sort of facet of personality, that persona you're trying to capture, it, it's it's going to go away, and uh, especially when you you know you, uh, a woman standing in a studio or in a space, um, you have to create an environment that feels really safe, um, because people are vulnerable. They don't have their clothes on. They're they're you know most of these people are a third of my age. They were probably in there in their mid-twenties or so, a few are in, in their thirties. So I wanted to create an environment where people felt really comfortable, where they could be, they could show strength in front of the camera. So um, the subjects that range here are, so, so a few are probably what I call really professional models that I found. Most of them, I would say, are amateur models that aspire to be models. In a few cases, out of the, I think I photographed 300 subjects over a 10-year period. Um, for, for those subjects, I've developed a relationship with, to the extent that I've continued an extended portrait of each of these four women. And so, uh, like with Brianna here, um, I've probably now made thousands of photographs. Not, not all on like roll film, like with a Hasselblad, and maybe a little digital, but. I, ultimately, I want to produce a book about the, these four women over, over a 10-year period. And their, some of their lives have changed because they've gotten married, they had a child. Um, I'm hoping that they, none of them move away. One of them is a Native American who lives in Maine. I unfortunately do not have a photo of Maya here. It breaks my heart that I don't have a, a print here. But, um, and you can see across the um, countertop, we have, we have Portraits made in the studio because I would contact a subject. They said, I'm happy to come to the studio. And 
uh, worked with you for an hour or two, and other subjects said, I, I can't travel, I don't have a car, uh, you can come to my home. So there were some people who were willing to let me into their home, and other people would say, you know, they want to keep that distance. And I was very accommodating. I, I drove, I was saying to, to Joel, I think, uh, you know, I drove to Vermont, I drove, drove to Maine, parts of Massachusetts to, to um, uh, uh, work with, with the subjects. And beyond the photography, I feel like the 10 years I spent, and, and, and I occasionally now still make uh, new portraits of, of, of my subjects, I feel that it helped me, it, it gave me a greater understanding of humanity because the people I, I photographed, some of them had PhDs, they were brilliant people, just uh, really interesting people. And some of my subjects, you know, you arrive, you go to an address and they're living in a broken down trailer. There was one woman in Vermont. I, I didn't know that until I arrived there. It was a cross section of humanity. It it taught me a lot about about life, and uh, and you can see I I really wanted to reach out and uh, photograph uh, people of different ethnic persuasions. Um, I found that it was harder to get um, a black woman to pose, and there were many more white women willing to to, to do that. And, uh, I photographed a few Asian women. There's a woman from Central America over in the corner there. But I, I saw this as a contemporary portrait of uh, mostly young women, and there was no prejudice brought. You know, sometimes photographers don't want to work with a subject that has tattoos. I thought, I said, I'm accepting you for who you are. No, no apologies. Um, I will, I will say something about just one photograph, and then if people have questions. Um, so early on, when I was started the project, this young woman came to my studio, and as soon as she disrobed, she started to. She was so she was very self conscious about the size of her breasts, and she started to apologize and make excuses. And I said. I think I said I'm photographing you as you are. I think you're a beautiful human being. She she said I'm actually modeling so I can raise money to buy breast implants. And that so colored my thinking that as I was working with her, I shared this a studio with a painter, and he was doing this very large <coughs> painting of men on a beach, kind of looking fiercely at each other, and. There was beautiful window light coming in, and <coughs> I asked the subject to come and stand in front of the painting. With now it appears obviously that the men are looking at her body, and, and and she's you know protecting herself with with her hands in a guarded way. And so each time I'd photograph someone, I I tried what they had to say without prying. I would never ask them personal questions, but you're going to have a conversation, and you learn something. And then that colors how you're going to interpret that person. Right to, you know, as I work on the images and I'm printing them and I decide to add light or take light away, um, the way I might move a light in the studio, that's, uh, we're translating technical stuff into emotional stuff, right? That, so that uh, hopefully you, you see something of what I saw in, in each of the subjects. Does that make sense? That, you know, we're dealing with all this, you know, you know, films and developers and f-stops and shutter speeds and n plus one and you know, or, or the digital side of things. But in the end, the image is going to work for the audience. That the, the viewer doesn't really give a flying leap about what f-stop you use if the picture works right. This isn't so. Uh, uh, this th it's always stayed with me. This woman who and, and I lost track of her, so I don't know whether she ever went through or not, but. Um, for those of you who are interested in portrait photography, listening very carefully, listening more than talking, is, is invaluable. And I found, I learned that from Lada. She would, she could just ask a very simple question and then let people go. And then they would, like she talked about photographing Eleanor Roosevelt, and she got Eleanor to talk about her sons, her children, and Eleanor started to move her hands and be excited, 
a lot of thought. That's the moment. Now, here's, here's this woman who's passionate about her family, her children. Um, and, and, you know, unlike, say, uh, you know, uh, you know, say, Karsh, Joseph Karsh is very accomplished, technically has made some beautiful purchase, but very different than Lada's approach, very humanistic approach. Old white um, guy who's been photographing subjects who are, are say, a third age. I, I thought, you know, I, could, I can do an edit, and I think I'm a pretty good editor. Um, but uh, in the end, I, I asked uh, a woman who taught with me who was in her 60s, who I really trusted, Bev Conway, and I asked a student who was mature beyond her years, but she was college age, about 20. I said, I want you to go through the photographs. I got it down to a reasonable number, but we were still dealing with hundreds, I would say. <laughs> Maybe even thousands, but I got it down to a number that was that was reasonable to go through. And, and I said, I want you to edit the show from a woman's perspective. That was really important. And as it turns out, I would I think it was ninety five percent of what I had selected in my mind. They picked. I didn't tell them what I had picked. And that made me feel um, that made me feel like my what my vision was in presenting these women to the public via show was, was in sync with uh, both men, men and women. Um, uh, let me just say, I, I know we're not supposed to talk a lot about the, the, the technical aspects, but to go back to my point about um, uh, being there for the subject, I really tried to keep my lighting in the studio extremely simple so that I would not have to be fussing with it because then my attention is diverted. So um, I would say the studio portraits in general, um, I, I was using to, uh, a beauty dish, a really big beauty dish, quite close to the subject, and um, uh, with a parabolic umbrella that lit the entire figure, but usually I would raise the light on the face just a tiny little bit, and um, Sometimes there's a backlight, sometimes there isn't a backlight. I, uh, um, I, I really try to keep things, I, I think people, people just get, photographers get too caught up in like, thinking they need a lot of light. Uh, I, I'm a big fan of using a, a broad light, it's beautiful, and use reflectors, reflect, you know, the fold-up reflectors, and I just clamp them, because I'm working by myself, I clamp them to, uh, so to light stands, and maybe it's down below, it could just be out of the frame there to, to bring some light up and work, work very simply. And I like to work at a particular f-stop. I, I want to drop the background out of focus, but I want to, I want to, I, I try very carefully, you know, hands are part of, you know, your signature as a human being, the hands, make sure the eyes, the face, and the hands were in focus, which would result in manipulating the camera a little bit to do that, but shoot wide open because, you know, uh, to me, the greatest compliment is when people say they, they, they see these as portraits. They're not. They're, they're, they're not meant to be erotic. They're meant to be portraits of women. And I call the show "Unburdened Beauty." That without, without <coughs> um, 